This lesson deals with switching applications. You can find these notes in the ECE 302 ebook in Chapter 3, starting on page 44. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at switching an inductive load and a capacitive load. In order for us to calculate the time domain response, let's go back to ECE 201 in Chapter 7, around pages 4 and 13, where I developed the following algorithm. The step response of a circuit containing independent sources, but only one inductance, resistances, and controlled sources, is of the form A plus B times E to the minus quantity T minus T0 divided by tau, where T is greater than or equal to T0. And F of T can be any voltage or any current in your circuit. Tau is the time constant. It's L over R Thevenin, where R Thevenin is a resistance seen by the terminals of L. A is equal to this expression when T approaches infinity, because this term drops out. And B is equal to F of T0 minus A. We also recall from ECE 201 that for an inductor, the current cannot change instantaneously. There's a similar algorithm for capacitor circuits with only one capacitance, and the time constant is R Thevenin times C, and for a capacitor, the voltage across it cannot change instantaneously. We're going to use that in the following pages. Let's take a look at switching an inductive load. Suppose that I have an inductor that has some series resistance, and it's in the collector lead of this inverter circuit. And suppose that the value of VB on is 0.7, VCE sat is equal to 0.2, and beta F is equal to 100. Those are our default values. Suppose that T equals T0 plus, we apply 5 volts here. What's going to happen? Well, we got 5 volts here, and we've got a voltage here if we forward bias it of 0.7. So current's going to flow from here to here, and the current's going to be this node voltage minus this node voltage divided by 1K, and that's 4.3 milliamps. Now the current in the inductor cannot change instantaneously, and if we just turn this circuit on, the current flowing in here prior to turning it on was zero, but must still be zero. So the ratio of I sub C to I sub B is going to be zero divided by 4.3 milliamps, and of course that's less than any number, in particular beta F. So I guess the saturation is correct. Let's calculate the current in the inductor, which is also the collector current. And it's going to be a first order differential equation because I only have one reactive element. We're starting at t equals t0 equal to 0. Our equation here is just going to be e to the minus t over tau. The value of tau is L over R Thevenin. By setting all the independent sources, that would be shorting this, shorting this, shorting this, and shorting this. And looking into these terminals, you would just see this resistor back to ground. And looking in this terminal, back to ground. So you'd see the resistor R sub C. If you want to draw that out, I'm just going to short all the independent sources, pull the terminals off of the inductor, and look back into that and you get a value of 175 ohms. So the ratio of this inductance to this resistance is 343 microseconds. The value of the current in the inductor at zero minus was zero, so it must be the same at zero plus. We can evaluate our equation then as a plus b times e to the minus zero. e to the minus zero is one, so it's equal to a plus b. If we wait long enough, as t approaches infinity, this inductor will become a short circuit, and the current flowing in it is gonna be five volts minus 0.2, divided by 175 ohms, and that's 27.4 milliamps. Our equation now, and let t approach infinity, we have a plus b times e to the minus infinity, but e to the minus infinity is zero, so that's gonna be equal to the value of a. If a is 27.4 milliamps, and a plus b is equal to zero, then b is equal to minus 27.4 milliamps. To put our solution together, we have a plus b e to the minus t over tau. But A and B are the same magnitude but opposite signs, so I'm going to pull that 27.4 milliamps out. And I'm left with 1 minus E to the minus T over tau. As T approaches infinity, this term gets smaller and smaller, so we're approaching 27.4 milliamps. The ratio of IC to IB we can then calculate is 27.4 milliamps over 4.3 milliamps, and that's 6.4. And that is less than 100. Our assumption that we're saturated really for all T is correct. Suppose at some time t0, the input goes from 5 to 0. And suppose that t0 is at least five time constants, which would be 1.72 milliseconds. If we have a zero input, then our base current is going to go to zero, and we're going to be in cutoff. Current in our inductor at t0 minus, and t0 plus would be the same, and that was 27.4 milliamps. But now, with zero volts here, we cut off the transistor, and this is now an open circuit. And this current in this inductor is going to flow into an open circuit, and theoretically it's going to approach infinite voltage. I know that that can't happen. But what happens with the transistor when the voltage across it starts to take off? Well, let's take a look at what's called the breakover voltage. A bipolar transistor has a rating that for zero current, and actually for any base current, 
if you eventually increase the collector emitter voltage high enough, things will start to conduct again. With zero current in our cutoff case, we would eventually start to have current flow. And basically this would look like a battery now of a value of B V sub C E zero. When you see a zero subscript as the third letter, that usually means open, that's referring to here the value of zero current. But actually any one of these currents will run into this line. The value of this depends on the transistor, but you can expect something between 50 and 150 volts. With our battery in our circuit of five volts, we're able to create actually a voltage that's huge compared to five volts. I should point out, this is how an ignition coil works in an automobile. We have current flowing through a coil and you break the coil and the current flows into a very high impedance or resistance and you get a very large voltage. In the case of the transistor, there is some limit that would stop that from running away to being thousands of volts. Operating a transistor in this breakdown region degrades it. We need to somehow get rid of that current that's flowing in the open circuit. We're gonna add what's called a damping diode. This is also sometimes called a flyback diode. We're gonna put it across the coil this resistance generally represents the resistance of the windings. In the ECE303 lab, we're actually going to build this circuit with a relay here. And this is roughly the values of that relay. Okay, what's going to happen with putting this diode here? Well, if we put 5 volts here and we saturate the transistor, then the voltage across the diode would be 0.2 minus 5, which would be a negative number, so the diode would be off. But if the input goes to zero and we cut off the transistor and current was flowing in here, it wants to flow this way or this way, this is a very high resistance, this is a basically a very low resistance, so the current will go through here this way and dissipate the energy in the coil. But when it does that, this node voltage lifts up. This would be roughly 0.7 plus 5, so it's going to jump up to 5.7. Without the diode, you would get a voltage here between maybe 50 and 150 volts. You'll build this in the 303 lab and actually see that with a 5 volt battery, you can create hundreds of volts. Let's simulate this last circuit by putting the damping diode across the coil. Here I've numbered all my node voltages. I'm going to apply an input that's say around 250 hertz, but as a square wave going between 0 and 5 volts. Vn is between 1 and 0, it's a pulse, between 0 and 5 volts, no time delay, a rise time and a fall time, and then a period. 1 over 250 hertz is 4 milliseconds. I pick the rise and fall time to be about 1 one hundredth of the period. It would depend on the function generator you have in lab, but this would be really short compared to this. And then I pick this, which is the pulse width, to be half of this. If you want a true square wave with the time you're high the same as the time as you're low, you have to subtract the 40 microseconds from the 2 milli. But it's okay, we're just trying to get a high and low level. I'll use my default values for the diode and for the transistor. So my transient is going to be for two cycles, so eight milliseconds. The rise time and fall time can be no smaller than the print step here. So this is one two hundredth of this number. We're going to start printing our results at zero. And we'll pick our ceiling step the same as our print step. You can see the rise and fall time of my square wave here. I'm going between zero and five volts. When the input is zero, we're cutting off the transistor and the output goes to five volts. And then we click you go to five volts and then the output drops low. It's actually about 50.2 millivolts. And then when we switch, this is trying to shoot off to over 100 volts. Then we clamp the output to one diode drop above the power supply. And you can see here that we eventually start to discharge the diode and the voltage starts to drop across it and then it kind of shuts off. And then we eventually go back and switch again. Let's take a look at the currents in the circuit. Here's the current in our coil. Starts out at zero and eventually goes to 28.171 milliamps. Now we calculated 27.4, but that was using a VCE set of 0.2 volts. I had to go back and recalculate this using what we found on the last page that VCE set was about 50.2 millivolts. How we get 28.28 milliamps. Then take a look at the current in the diode. It starts out at zero, and then we kick in with, with our damping diode and eventually discharge most of the energy in the coil and bring this back to a very low value. This again is about the same value that was in the coil prior to switching. Let me point out one more thing. This is the case of simulating it with the damping diode in. If we took the damping diode out, we wouldn't predict what we did by our hand calculations with the breakover voltage because SPICE does not have that parameter built into it. We'll learn later in modeling courses that you can add features to the SPICE models with external circuits with a thing called macro modeling. Let's switch a capacitive load, put it across the collector emitter. 
I put a one microfarad capacitor here, but we'll see what the technique produces as a result, and it would just be a function of the values of the Rs and C in our circuit. Suppose that at T equals T0 plus, I apply 5 volts here. Current's going to flow of 5 volts minus 0.7 divided by 1K, and again 4.3 milliamps. That's a good size amount of current, so let's assume that the output saturates. And eventually, in steady state, this capacitor will become an open circuit, and so the current that's flowing in the collector will be the current in the resistor. And that's going to be 5 volts minus 0.2 divided by 220 ohms, or about 21.8 milliamps. The ratio of that with the base current is 5.1. Our assumption that we were saturated checks. Suppose at some time T0 in the future, we change the input from 5 volts to 0 volts. That's going to cut off the transistor. Our model would just be an open circuit. We'd have our resistor and then our capacitor. There was an initial condition here of 0.2 volts. And now our equation for the capacitor would be some A plus B times E to the minus quantity T minus T0 over tau. If you set this voltage source equal to zero, short this back to ground, look in here, you see the 220 ohm resistor. The 220 times the one microfarad is 220 microseconds. Let's find A and B. V of T0 plus is the same as T0 minus, which was 0.2 volts. That's going to be A plus B times E to the T minus T0, or 0. E to 0 is 1, so A plus B is 0.2. As T approaches infinity, this will become an open circuit. The current will go to 0 in here. No place for it to go. Can't go here, can't go here. We just have 5 volts. That's going to be A plus B times E to the minus infinity, or just A. A plus B is 0.2, and A is 5, then B is minus 4.8. This is our equation then for the voltage across the capacitor. Here's our previous schematic. I'm going to use again the 250 hertz square wave here, so I'll use the same command I had before. Basically it's the same file, just putting in the capacitor, taking out the coil. It's always good to look at the input to make sure it is what you think it is. So we are getting a 5 volt square wave. And then you can see here that initially I'm applying 0 volts and it jumps up to 5, so I'm going to cut off the transistor. The output lifts up to 5 volts because we're cut off. And then as we switch the input to 5 volts, we then saturate at about 0.052 volts. Then when the input drops to zero, then we cut off the transistor and the capacitor starts to charge to five volts. Now five time constants would be five times the 220 microseconds, and that's 1.1 milliseconds. And you can see that's about what it is right here. But no matter what the capacitive load is, basically going to multiply this RC product by five, and that's the time it takes to go from the low value to the high value. When you're doing digital logic circuits, you may have a few femtofarads of capacitance. There's always this kind of a waveform when you're switching a load whether you put a physical capacitor there or not, because there's always stray capacitance. And these are examples of switching circuits.